When we were talking about termite mounds, Rupert, uh, you mentioned an interesting phrase, a uh, dynamic architecture. Now, how does that differ from regular architecture? Okay, yeah, right. Dynamic architecture essentially is what we're trying to do is, is shorten the time frame between the process of actually doing something and, and designing something. So if we look at termites, as we have become familiar with, then we know that <coughs> essentially our agents, termites, as designers are actually there's a continuum. They are sensing a change to their environment and they're initiating a reaction to make a modification. And of course, as soon as they do, then it changes all the other agent behaviors around it. So, you know, we don't struggle to see that as a very dynamic response. Traditional architecture or the architecture of the Industrial Revolution type of architecture tends to put a large distance between the, the abstraction of a design process and the process of construction itself. And essentially what we're moving towards is by using computerization and simulation and modeling processes, we're shortening the time frame between the information we can glean from a specific site, the design process, and ultimately the building that goes onto that site. So just to uh, paint the picture again of what a dynamic architecture would look like in the case of a termite mound, for example, it's the termites are continually changing the structure of the thing to meet the whatever needs the occupants, namely the termites have, or whatever changed environmental circumstances the colony finds itself in. So, so how would that uh, translate into something that, say, would happen in a human-occupied building? Well, I think most people come into that discussion of dynamic architecture, what does it mean? And, and particularly when they're talking about relating it to social insects is you replace a social insect for a robot, let's say. So you imagine a, a process, a, a design and architectural process, which is using lots of robotic devices that are accreting material and, and building this structure that they're actually not only building, but then maintaining and reusing and recycling da, 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 as, a, as a continuum. Now, that kind of architecture or that kind of approach, we can say, yes, that will come for, say, colonization of the moon and uh, in situ resource utilization. But I don't see that kind of dynamicism influencing architecture and isn't influencing architecture at the moment. When we talk about termites as agents, we're relating them to computer agents and agents and a computer environment negotiating a set of requirements that the building ultimately needs to produce a set of solutions and those solutions will iterate through it. One of the most important components that comes out of this though is that as we look at how all of those agents interact in their seemingly complex way, the actual individual behaviors of the termite or the agent or the whatever is the computer agent is actually quite simple. All they're trying to do is execute a set of simple rules and the fact that they're all interacting seems to produce the complexity. As we look at an agent-based architecture, well, of course, some of those agents will be negotiating on behalf of the ventilation, on behalf of comfort, on behalf of bringing uh, resources and energy into and out of the building. But also we can introduce other components in here. There's a component of an agent of aesthetic, which could be what traditional architecture was. But more importantly, there's you and me as the inhabitant or the occupant of the building that becomes one of those agents in its own right. So what we have now is a negotiation of a structure where all the players get a little say in what actually comes out of it. Now the problem is, of course, as we've touched on, that what you get is a, is a static solution. At some point the design freeze has to occur and out comes our wonderful building that's working to the environment. The problem is, at the moment, we have a, a culture in which people move from one building to another. We've lost that kind of um, ability of a family growing up in a family for generations, and they learn how to use a building, a building with many windows, many doors, that they manipulate those spaces and drive very complicated ventilation solutions because they learn as agents how to deal with them on the spot. So, in that solution, what we can do is say, well, we can integrate a digital system into a building which memorizes all of those interactions of how you and me as the occupant use these complex solutions, this redundancy of ventilation that we put into the building and stores that as a memory. So when we talk about a, a dynamic architecture and an agent architecture, we're not just talking about the digital generation. The important component is, comes back to, if you like, um, is that you and I are the agents too, and we should be interacting and using that system within it.
I can see the, the interesting uh, technological implications of this, but uh, a skeptic would come along and say, but, uh, you know, don't people do that anyway? And uh, this relates to another interesting phrase that uh, came up in, in the second segment, namely vernacular architecture. And uh, a skeptic would come along and say, uh, haven't traditional architects, that is, uh, uh, people who <coughs> build uh, buildings uh, rather than relying upon architects and engineers to build buildings, for them, uh, you know, traditional habitations, don't they do that anyway? Uh, I would absolutely agree, but there's a difference. And what we're talking about is, yes, we are saying there is a step back here to a vernacular position, a, a step back or away from a system which unifies an architecture, which produces a structure that can generally be reproduced in any location in the world because it has separated that an, an occupant or that inhabitant from the environment that they're in. If we are to produce buildings where the environment is an integral part of living in that, that environment and that space and that building, then they have, the building has to be sensitive to it. And what architecture, what digital architecture can potentially do is if you imagine a, a, a a town, uh, you know, and when we talk about a, a medieval town as a classic example, and, and its slow growth and accretion through negotiation of, of many different properties, but no actual overarching authoritative control on it, potentially what we can do is we can look at how a, a, an urban environment is grown chronologically, and at some point we can say, now extend that digitally. And we can actually take what's there and theoretically move and grow a set of solutions which is not structured, it, it doesn't have a design intent to it, but what it creates is something more fractal, more interesting, and potentially more functional in, in so doing. Aren't we talking about really a radical change in the relationship though between the occupants of a building or the occupants of a town and what architects and engineers might do, you know, in the traditional, well, not in the traditional, but in the modern sense. So uh, uh, people uh, basically take what they are given by by the architects and the town planners. They are very much the subjects of, 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 of those, those highly skilled professionals. But what you're really talking about is that uh, an, an, an architect is in fact a kind of a mediator between an occupant and the environment that that person or family might find themselves in. Yeah. What you're talking about really is, is, is architects and engineers basically implementing living buildings uh, of, a, of a kind in which the control now passes to the occupants rather than, 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 uh, than being the subject of, uh, of, uh, of elite architects and planners. I think there's a few key points in there. One of the key ones is that architecture at the moment doesn't provide that set of redundancy requirements that allow an occupant, you and me, to do what I would do with my own body, which is put a sweater on, take a sweater off, mm -hmm. you know, make some physical modification. In terms of ventilation, which, you know, is dear to your, yours and my heart, it's about not putting one window in the side of a, a house that can just be opened up. It would be, say, putting in two, three, four, and opening them in interesting ways to use that turbulent flow that ripples across the surface and drive a, a bellows movement, a transient state, which we see in the termite mounds, to enhance the ventilation within. Not because it was designed by an architect, but what the architect did was provide a set of redundant conditions which these performance-enhancing things can emerge. Amazing future. Well, thank you very much, Rupert, for coming to visit us today. And uh, until we meet again, this is Scott Turner wishing you a good day. Mm -hmm.